So we're going to start this morning with a little fun exercise. I'm going to give you a second. Get hold of a piece of paper and a pen or your cell phone or your tablet, somewhere that you can just type something. Uh, I need you to write something down. So I'm going to give you a second to do this. This is going to be a fun exercise. You, you need to, to grab a little something. Okay, sure you've got that. So I, I want you to write down on your piece of paper or on your, your tablet. I wouldn't be here without. And once you've written that, I want you to write in a name. I want you to write the name of the person who helped you become the person that you are today. I wouldn't be here without name. That's the person that helped me to become the person I am by investing in my life, by caring for me, by mentoring me, by loving me, that changed me and, fo and shaped me to become the person that I am. So you've done that. The reason I start like this is because that's how the kingdom of God works, right? Our faith in Jesus Christ is, is passed down, not, not by books or by sermons, but by people. One life to another. One generation to another generation. And that's our new series that we're going to start today. Uh, and, and to help us with that, uh, I, I brought along a little bit of a, of a, of a lesson uh, that, that, that we can use. And I, I want to use these three chairs. And now I know those who are in Central are saying, you preached that sermon. Yeah, I preached the three chair sermon on 17th of September 2017. People, prosperity, purposelessness, commitment, compromise, conflict, saved, saved, not saved, not the same sermon. I wouldn't do that because you would remember that one way too well. But we are going to use these chairs to, to talk a little bit about one generation blessing another. So this middle chair, this middle chair represents you. Your life, your relationships, who you are, all the things that you've accomplished, the fullness of your amazing life. This is you. But here's the thing. If we're honest with ourselves, we all know that I did not accomplish this, my life, who I am, and all the things in me. I did not accomplish that on my own. I'm only here because of all the folks that are around me and help me become that person. And that takes us to this chair. This chair represents the person whose name you wrote down on your cell phone or your iPad or on your piece of paper represents that person. The person who, who invested in your life. Uh, with a commitment, who, who mentored you, who cared for you, who guided you. But I want you to see something. Uh, next to this chair, I want you to see another chair, and another chair, and another chair, and another chair, and another chair, going on right back to Jesus. Because that's how this message has been passed down. This wonderful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ from one chair to another chair to another chair to another chair to another chair. Which brings us to this third chair. And by now, I'm sure you've guessed what this chair is. This chair represents the person who comes after you. That person who is going to sit in your pew 25 years from now, the next generation. But here's the thing. No one ends up in this chair by accident. Someone told them. Unfortunately, Sometimes we lose sight of this fact. And we say, well, I'm stuck in the past. I, I've, I've paid my dues. 
I, I've done my work. I've been there all the time. Now it's just time for me to sit and this is just me. I'm stuck in the past. Or we say, well, well, I'm here in the present, but here's the thing. Do you know how busy I am? Do you know how my life looks like? Do you know that I just can't do all of this stuff? The problem is we end up with a two-chair church. And you know, all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you've seen that before. You've seen that in our own city. You've seen that in our own presbytery. Where we had these amazing churches that were strong and thriving. And then slowly but slowly, we, we saw them get smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and then they had to close. Not because they didn't follow Scripture. Not because they didn't teach the Gospel. Because they didn't pass it on to the next generation. They might have had wonderful programs that worked at some stage, but the programs never kept pace with how change happened and how the new generation happened and what their needs were. They might have had the most amazing leadership that did so well, but unfortunately they did not have the vision to mentor, to guide, to grow the new generation so that they can come up and take over and take over the leadership of the church. And they ended up with a two-chair church and actually ended up closing their doors. Can I say that again? No one ends up in that third chair by accident. Someone has to tell them. That brings me to our scripture passage for today. So he says, so, so listen to me when I speak to you, says verse 1 and then verse 2, Psalm 78, verse 2 to 4. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He says, so listen up, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. And we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. We will tell the next generation from one chair to another chair to another chair. We will tell the next generation. And you can follow that throughout scripture. God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you, but you need to bless, be a blessing for the nations and I will bless you and you need to tell your descendants and their descendants and their descendants. When God talks about the law in Deuteronomy 6, he says, teach your children about this. Sharpen this into them by day, by night, wherever you go from one generation to another generation. Because you see, my friends, it's not just about you. It's about that faith that is being passed on because that's how the kingdom of God works. It's one generation passing the baton to the next generation. And that's the one for next week. We're doing this for three weeks. I'll talk about passing the baton next week. One generation passing the baton to the next generation. Think of this for a second. But here's this amazing church called Central Church. Been here for approximately 140 years. It's a three-chair church. It's a Jesus church where the lost are found, where the broken are healed, where the lonely find comfort. We're led by the Spirit, we're empowered by prayer, and we're guided by the Scriptures. But let's be honest. 
It's not because of you, because of me. We didn't start it. It started way before us. And these generations had the vision to empower, to teach, to guide, to give to the new generation. From one generation to another generation to another generation. And that's why we can stand here as a three-chair church, as a Jesus church. But we have to continue that. The thing is, there's a trap that we can fall in. We can fall into a trap of three excuses for not doing this. First excuse, I- I'm too old. I- I've done my, di- di- my, 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 my thing. I- 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 I've paid my dues. I've been here. I served. I gave. I've done everything. It's time for me just to sit back. Can I tell you something? You're never too old to pass on your faith. Can I tell you something even more important than that? Have you ever read the scriptures properly? Who are the people that God places the highest value on? Isn't it always the elders? Where did the children go? Where did the people go to find wisdom and guidance? To the elders who sat at the entrance of the city. They would go ask their guidance, their help. Who were the ones who taught the children? There was the elders that taught the children of their faith. Don't tell me you're too old. When you're old, you're in the prime to take that faith that you have carried all this year, all these years, and you can build it into these young folks, our next generation, so that there is a third chair that will carry this on. Second excuse that we often hear, I'm too busy. And we all know about that. If I look at my calendar right now, it's only September's end, and uh, and mine looks scary already. But the question is this, with what is your calendar filled? Is it filled with real things that help to make your life more real? and full, and that which God wants, or is it just filled with a lot of busyness stuff? Because there's a difference between a busy life and a full life, right? Busy life is filled with all kinds of stuff, stuff that keeps us busy from morning to noon to night, and I come home, and I'm so tired, and I know the next morning I have to get up, and there's a lot of stuff that I have to go do again, and it's stuff all over, and it's wild. But a full life is a life that invests in not just my own life, but in other lives, where I make time to to take that which I have and to take those gifts and to utilize them into the lives of others by mentoring, by guiding, by teaching, by spending time by caring. Because here's the thing. Guiding the next generation is not just the work of the church. It's the work, sorry, I said that wrong. It's not just the work of parents. It's also the work of the church and the faith community. Research showing us that. Showing that children, difference between children who grow up in the church and then are grown-ups and leave the church and children that grow up in the church and stay in the church is the grown-ups who had a faith walk and walked that faith walk with those children and shared their faith life with these children. This little book called Sticky Faith. It's one called Sticky Church as well. Sticky Faith. Sticky Faith actually says the ratio 
for doing this is five to one. We actually need five adults for every child to work into their lives. Can I challenge you? Will you please be one of those five who is prepared to invest in the life of the next generation in this church? Not just your own child. You hear that? I said that wrong, right? It's not just the parents. It's the church as well. Those who stay are those who were mentored by those who were living their faith life towards them. Five to one. Paul knew that. That's why Paul, when he writes um, to Timothy, writes this, 2 Timothy 3, 14. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. See what he's saying. He says, Timothy, so, so continue to do what you have been taught because there were those who taught you and now you have, are convinced of those things because you know those people who taught you. You saw their faith walk. You know them. He knew Paul. He knew Silas. He knew Mark. He knew Luke. He knew Aquila. He knew Priscilla. And these people all worked into Timothy's life. And he says, so Timothy, because of that, you can continue this and stay in this. But it's not just about you, Timothy. That's why Timothy's life could grow because he learned from these other people. If you really want to see this in action, and I said this last week, just go to Kid Zone one Sunday morning and go watch those kids and then watch those teachers that are busy with these kids and watch their faces. It's the most amazing gift. Third, last excuse is one that is not easily said out loud. It'll kind of be like, hmm, good idea, or wonderful plan but I'm not interested. We can say that, but there's a cost to that. If we show the next generation that we are not interested in them, they will not be interested in faith. Go look at the churches, how empty they are running, because they're too chair. Churches. And no, no, no. No, it's not culture's fault. I know culture is a mess. It's the church's fault. Because sometimes I think culture cares far more about the hearts and minds of the next generation than the church does. Here's the thing, my friends. We can't just say, well, I'm not interested, or okay, okay, I'll be interested. It has to go further than that. We have to say, I am prepared to do whatever it takes, and I am going to get involved. And you're saying, but, but, but I don't know anything about the youth. I'm not cool. They don't need cool. They need care. But, but I'm not an expert. I, I, I don't know these. They don't need experts. They need your life experience where they can just leech off you. But I'm not a lecturer. I can't lecture. They don't need lectures. Get enough of those. They need love. Because they will not end up in that third chair by accident. They need people. So last thing I want to ask you. I want to take you back to that piece of paper or your iPad or your phone where you wrote, I wouldn't be here without, and you wrote someone's name. What I want you to do now is I want you to put your own name in there. I wouldn't be here without Aubrey. And then I want you to ask yourself this question. Who is going to write that about me? 25 years from now. Amen. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for the message of Jesus, of hope, of life, 
of change. Thank you that, that you trust us with this gospel. And we are allowed to pass this baton from one generation to another. We each wrote a name today. I wouldn't be here without, and we wrote that name. Because someone believed in us, invested in us. So this is us now, Lord. We want to write our own name there. We want to say to you today, Lord, here I am. Use me as I am with my gifts so that I too can touch the heart of the new generation. Can't do it on our own. We can only do it in the strength and the power of your Holy Spirit with your guidance and in your name, Lord Jesus. And this is what we pray. Amen. That was fun to spend this morning with you. So uh, as you go into this week, think of where you can influence someone with your gifts. And then remember that the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the wonderful presence, fullness of the Holy Spirit will be with you. Amen.